Hi, I'm Ken Howard, and welcome to the Gay Therapy LA podcast. Today, I want to talk about gay men and when it's time to break up a relationship. You know, they say love is grand, and it is, really. In, in my 29 years in 2021, as a gay men's specialist, psychotherapist, couples therapist, sex therapist, and life career executive coach, I offer all of those services. I've worked with hundreds of gay male couples to help them improve their relationships to stay together and make a go of it, usually focusing on what I call the three C's of relationship success, commitment, communication, and compromise. And there's a previous podcast episode on those. Many times, or most of the time, if that's not too immodest of me to say, it works. You know, couples therapy really tends to work. The problems are solved, or at least mitigated, and the couple moves on from therapy or relationship coaching to be happier together for years to come. But not all the time. So today, I'd like to help guys by offering some thoughts for those who find themselves, after careful consideration, in the position of needing to break up with their partner. Let's talk about the dating process first. When I work with single gay men, there is often the discussion of where do you find good men to date? And that's a huge $64,000 question, as the old 1950s game show used to say. If I knew that answer, I'd have bottled it years ago and retired, or at least spent more time on a beach somewhere. But I don't have that answer, really, and how to meet good guys for dating is another whole topic. I help guys with that, but it's a, it's a big challenge. But every long-term, committed, successful, on many levels, relationship starts with the dating process. And dating is a process of being exposed to a person who evolves from a stranger to an acquaintance to boyfriend and then to partner, spouse, lifelong companion, etc. by any other name. The dating process is about learning about each other, experiencing each other's behaviors and emotions, and then noticing our own responses to those shared experiences. Dating is about having an experience, then reflecting on its effects and meanings for our quality of life. When we have repeated good experiences, our levels of bonding, emotional investment, trust, and connection grow with that person that we're dating. Many times our experience of that person is accurate if we think they are a good person through and through, they usually are. If we think they are a good partner for us, they are, especially given time. But there are times when the dating process, even a long one, fools us. And later, we come to realize that the person that we thought was right for us for a long-term committed relationship, and that includes committed relationships that are consensually non-monogamous, by the way, isn't the person that we thought they were. We come to realize that we were just wrong about their long-term potential because we overlooked something in them, in ourselves, or they changed, or we changed, or the world changed. But not every relationship that works at one point in time still works at a later point in time. And that's okay. Let's talk about evaluating a relationship. In stable, happy relationships, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, sure, all relationships take work, and sometimes working through problems, through careful communication and compromise. But many relationships that are stable, happy enough, and enduring don't require the partners to sit back and evaluate their relationship or question it all that often. A little coming and going of ambivalence about your relationships is normal, though. But there are times when concerns about a relationship involve a subjective uneasiness that we feel 
about the balance of reflecting on our experiences in that relationship day to day that leave us feeling, instead of supported, amused, validated, and loved, leave us feeling suspicious, anxious, undermined, invalidated, mistrustful, abandoned, frightened, or just plain unhappy. And that's not good. That's a, a gut feeling that something in our relationship or something in the way we currently are living in that relationship is wrong for us. Living day to day in the days, weeks, months, or years into a relationship means listening to that inner voice that evaluates our subjective experiences in relation to that other person. Done periodically and very subtly, cumulatively, we arrive at a certainty of our feelings. We either learn to relax and place our trust in that person in a profound commitment, which leads to cohabitation, living with that person, or marriage, or other markers of commitment like combining finances or owning property or a business together. Or we hold back because we are responding to our own internal psychological defenses, not quite letting go and placing profound love and trust in that other person. We hold back from committing in our relationship the way we might have seen our parents, grandparents, or siblings commit to their spouses or partners, you know, oftentimes for decades. We've probably seen our parents or grandparents be in, in a successful relationship for decades. Experiences with our partners guide us. When they do something that is a romantic gesture, we might smile, laugh, get horny, or feel relaxed and relieved to be with them. But when they do other behaviors, we feel like our defenses are activated and not-so-nice feelings get triggered. We get scared when we see them express anger in ways that make us feel on guard or intimidated into a fight-or-flight response. We feel icky when they do something that shows a betrayal to us, such as looking into our phones without permission or doing some kind of snooping or surveillance that make us feel watched or mistrusted, often out of some pathological jealousy or possessiveness. We feel embarrassed when they treat someone else badly, like service workers in a restaurant or a store, or when they say something to someone else about ourselves or our relationships that should have been kept private. We feel suspicious when we know that their actions and their words don't match, and we calculate the logic of the situation and know that for whatever reason, they're not telling the truth. Or maybe it's more blatant. They, they break a monogamy agreement. They cheat. They sleep with someone else when we have an agreement not to have that. Or maybe they break a ground rule that's been set in a consensual non-monogamous relationship. And then we're left to confront and discuss and understand and carve a path forward in the aftermath of that incident. Or maybe they have a mental illness or a psychiatric disorder, a personality disorder, the narcissist, the borderline, the antisocial. Maybe they have a substance problem with a drug or alcohol or just some other condition that demands too much of us to cope with in this lifetime. So when enough of the experiences that make us feel anxious, divested, scared, or just unhappy accumulate, we dance around a feeling that eventually leads to a conclusion that we are not happy in this relationship and we realize that this person is not who we wanted them to be or expected them to be or thought they could be or fundamentally needed them to be and we reluctantly come to a deep-seated conclusion that this relationship is not good for our mental health and well-being and likely never will be. We would be better off without them, without the relationship, without living this way. We want out, even if the relationship is entrenched 
with sharing a living space, being a couple day to day, being known as a couple to friends and family, and having emotional, physical, or financial ties together that would be time consuming and emotionally and practically difficult to unentangle. That's the time when, after revisiting our options in our mind, we need to confront our partner. We need to sit them down, acknowledge that we are not happy, and either propose, insist, that we identify and engage gay affirmative couples therapy, or we assert breaking up. So let's talk about how to do that when you have to do that. Over the many years of my practice, I've worked with clients on this process. It happened again just recently with a client. In these cases, my clients were clear that the situation they were in was not at all likely to benefit from couples therapy or relationship coaching. I do both of those. The differences that the client perceived, experienced, and really knew on a deep level were not things that could be fundamentally changed by behavioral change or increase, improved communication or negotiations with that partner. Their partner was just not made from the kind of cloth of the kind of partner they existentially needed in this lifetime according to their own value system their character, their values, or their deep-seated neuroses were just not ever going to be compatible and they didn't want to even propose the option of couples therapy. Which takes courage because as a couples therapist I've been able to help sometimes even the most complex cases improve their relationship enough to be happy again for the long term. But for some of my clients they know on a deep level that the couples therapy option is not something they feel will work and they don't want to waste time and considerable money when they know they need something different, someone different to be their life partner. So one client recently, let's call him Mark, was this way. He processed his feelings with me in individual therapy sessions for weeks beforehand. He enumerated and described various events in the recent history of his relationship, what happened and how he felt about each incident. He discussed these in the context of his own vulnerabilities, such as his own history of relationships, his patterns, his family of origin influences, his own neuroses and insecurities, his own trauma history, and his own cultural and developmental influences for where he was from and how old he was in the lifespan. Developmental issues. He was convinced he wanted to break up with his partner and he was frank that he didn't need or want my permission or validation but only my support in the process of carrying out the conscious uncoupling as actress Gwyneth Paltrow once described of his relationship. So we talked about approach. When you need to do this, pick a time when you can sit your partner down and not be interrupted for a while. Ask to put smartphones away or be otherwise free of distractions. Be in a place that has privacy, preferably in your home. Don't do it if one of you is acutely ill or in a rush or under some kind of work pressure deadline or if they're drunk or high or distracted by another major life event such as being concerned about a sick relative or contemplating taking a new job offer. Now there is no ideal time but try to clear the decks for what will inevitably be a significant if perhaps dramatic conversation. Be clear about your intentions don't ever have a I'm thinking of breaking up with you conversation if what you really mean to say is I'm breaking up with you. Don't confuse your partner by couching it in euphemisms. You know, have the resolve to say what you mean. You can root your statements in your feelings in the classic I statements. Don't say you do or don't whatever, but instead say I've been giving this a lot of thought 
and very careful consideration. And I have decided that I need to leave this relationship. I need something else for my life. And this is the conclusion I've come to. Then you let your partner respond. If their defenses are working properly, which they probably will be, they will either be very sad and appealing to your sympathies, angry, you're making a big mistake, you'll never find anyone as good as me, in shock, I can't believe what I'm hearing, you can't mean that, or some other strong emotion. But be resolute. Let them have their reaction, but if you've done your preparation, there is nothing they can say that will make you backtrack or change your mind on the spot. This is why it's important to give a lot of thought to this and maybe processing in your own therapy before you drop the bomb of the breakup conversation. Now, let's digress a second with a word of caution. If you are a victim of domestic violence, that's another situation. That's another whole topic that I'm not covering here. We know from research that the most dangerous time for a victim of domestic violence is when they state or act on leaving the abusive partner, who can become enraged at the abandonment and the loss of control, and they can become lethally violent. People have been killed this way. So please be aware that this discussion is not for domestic violence situations. So. It's natural for your partner's feelings to run high after you've stated your intentions. So let them have their reaction. Just take a step back and let them have their reaction. They may or may not have seen this coming. In my experience, they usually have not. It's usually a shock that they have to process in the moment of responding to you. But have some preparations for the immediate aftermath of the conversation. Where will you sleep tonight? Where will they? Will you move out to somewhere else, a friend's, a hotel, an, an Airbnb facility, a family member's? Or will you ask them, which may depend on whose name your housing's registered in, if you're not on a joint lease in an apartment or flat or a tenants in common sharing a mortgage? A discussion of the practicalities of who moves out and how soon can be briefly discussed or can wait until possibly the next day. Issues of what kind of housing is affordable or available in your local location is also a consideration, especially in urban centers with high housing costs. I'm in Los Angeles. Housing costs are astronomical. New York City or San Francisco or San Jose you know, housing costs would be a big issue in a breakup just on a practical level. A discussion of who to tell when about family and friends and the breakup can take place. I think it's only natural that your partner will need to discuss this with someone else close to them, such as a sibling or a best friend or a coworker, and I would just let them have this. I think it's also helpful for both of you and them to realize that you both will probably run through in a non-sequential order the classic Elizabeth Kubler-Ross stages. You know, she was originally describing people diagnosed with terminal illness, but I, I think it applies to other strong emotional reaction situations as well. And Kubler-Ross, you know, identified denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Let me repeat those. The, the Kubler-Ross classic stages are denial, this isn't happening, anger, angry reaction, bargaining, well, maybe we can give it a try for another month, you know, some kind of a, a bargaining discussion. Depression, I guess my life is over now. You know, and then acceptance, and that's the long-term resolution, is the acceptance of the situation, and that takes some time. If you look at your partner's emotional reactions in the days ahead as evidenced by what he says verbally, as well as reflecting on your own emotional states and reactions, you'll probably recognize those five emotional states. And sometimes they'll be in rapid and alternating succession. They're, they're not linear and sequential. They, they tend to kind of rotate um, in a way that can look like the person's having... Uh, abrupt emotional reactions and changes. 
So look for those, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. They'll probably be there. So even people, in this case gay men, who have in their lifetimes long and happy relationships, like when I work with older guys or middle-aged guys, they'll almost always have had the experience at least once and probably a number of times the experience of going through a difficult breakup often when they're young either they were the dumper or they were the dumpy or both but as the saying from Alcoholics Anonymous says living life on life's terms means that we will probably not get through this lifetime whoever we are without having to face the classically emotional painful experience of a relationship breakup but let's talk about the aftermath you know the breakup pain is not the last word we generally are not masochists in this life we don't do breakups because they're fun we do breakups when we find it absolutely necessary to as the US presidential oath of office says preserve protect and defend our profoundly existential mental health and well-being. We leave one relationship not because we sadistically want to punish someone else, even though we feel they might deserve it if they've wronged us, but because we love ourselves enough and cherish our lifetimes enough that we act in order to give ourselves the opportunity, the chance, the clean slate to allow a more appropriate more comfortable, more nurturing, more stable, more rewarding relationship and the partner that that comes with to come into our lives. We go through the cruelty that it can feel breaking up with someone only to be kind to ourselves and also to let that partner go and let them have the opportunity to be loved in the way that we can't give them and to give ourselves the opportunity to be loved in the way that they can't give us. It's difficult only in the relatively short term to be easier in the much longer term for the rest of our lives. Taking care of ourselves to do the things that we need to do to get by in life is part of the adult prerogative. To love ourselves and to practice self-care in small ways daily and in big ways like how and where and with whom we live day to day. It's part of the job of adulting, that word you hear these days. And it can be positive in the long run, even if it feels difficult or even painful in the short term. So, if you need help with big decisions and actions, like starting or ending a relationship, or starting or ending a job or a career or any major life decision, please consider LGBT plus affirmative therapy or coaching services. Life's challenges do become a bit easier when in the context of getting help from a supportive and qualified professional. And I'd like that to be me if you have the need. So email ken at gaytherapyla.com and there's blog articles and other information about my coaching and psychotherapy services, psychotherapy if you're in California where I'm licensed, coaching or consulting in other places around the world even at gaytherapyla.com or you can call or preferably text my phone that's in the United States, uh, area code 310-339-5778. So 310-339-5778 comes right to me. And uh, you can get more information on the therapy and coaching services that either I or one of my associates provide. So thanks, and I'll see you next time.